Ships are built to survive the planet's harshest environments. Why then do some sea zones keep swallowing them, leaving behind little more than rumors and empty coordinates? In the last year, scientists have uncovered another ocean graveyard, a hotspot where modern technology still falls silent and wrecks vanish faster than search teams can respond. As debris drifts for hundreds of nautical miles and signals fade beneath crushing depths, the evidence all but evaporates. Is this the work of chance or is there a repeatable recipe that dooms certain stretches of ocean again and again? The answer starts where disappearance becomes measurable. Currents do not just move water, they erase clues. When a ship founders, the ocean surface and subsurface flows carry debris far from the point of disaster. Drift models show wreckage can travel 50 to 100 nautical miles in a single day, driven by fast currents and wind. Lifeboats and floating cargo ride the surface, swept along by leeway and stokes drift, while heavier wreckage sinks rapidly out of reach. At depths of 4,000 meters, the pressure climbs above 400 atmospheres, enough to crush air-filled spaces and distort steel. Most sunken ships at these depths remain invisible to sonar, buried beneath darkness and sediment. Even signals vanish quickly. Modern tracking systems, such as AIS, lose contact beyond the horizon, usually around 40 nautical miles, unless satellites are watching. In the early 1900s, radio range was even shorter, and a single storm could silence a ship's last message. The result is that evidence scatters, signals fade, and the search box balloons from a single dot to hundreds of square miles. In these conditions, disappearance becomes a measurable process, not just a mystery. A ship's last known position is rarely a single pinpoint. In reality, small uncertainties, such as an imprecise log entry, a drifting lifeboat, or a missed radio signal, multiply as time and ocean movement act. Search planners call this the uncertainty corridor. The idea is simple and relentless. From the moment a vessel is lost, every hour widens the possible area to search. Wind, current and waves each nudge debris and survivors in different directions. Surface drift models show that after just 72 hours, the likely search zone can stretch beyond 1,000 square nautical miles. Some objects ride fast surface currents, others sink or get caught in eddies, creating a patchwork of probabilities instead of a single target. Search and rescue teams use probabilistic spread models to predict where debris might surface, but with every passing tide, the odds finding anything drop. Drift and down current transport can scatter pieces quickly, turning a single event into a wide, confusing evidence field. This is why so many disappearances evolve from a small question mark on the map into a vast uncertain field, where clues scatter and the corridor of possibility grows wider than the resources available to search it. On July 26, 1909, the passenger liner Warata steamed out of Durban, bound for Cape Town, with 211 people on board. The ship's log reported calm weather, but by nightfall, the coast near the Agulhas Current was already notorious among mariners for its unpredictable violence. Lucy Bannister, a passenger, wrote in her diary that the ship rolled heavily and that top-heavy concerns were noted. Crewman Edward Granger sent a final telegram saying Warata was leaving port, weather fine, but the vessel listed slightly. As Warata pressed south, the route hugged the wild coast, a corridor where the Agulhas Current runs fast, sometimes over five knots, against prevailing winds. When a southwesterly gale collides with this current, waves steepen sharply, rising in minutes from rolling swells to breaking walls of water. Captain Ilbury's last radio contact, relayed from the Maritzburg, gave no sign of trouble. He reported that the ship was steady and all were well. That was the last confirmed message. By the next morning, Warata had vanished. The search that followed quickly ran into the limits of early 20th century tracking. The last sighting, logged near 31 degrees 50 minutes south, 29 degrees 10 minutes east, left a vast margin of error. Without continuous radio or position fixes, the possible lost zone stretched for hundreds of nautical miles. Rescue ships combed the coast, but the Agulhas current, known for scattering debris at 50 to 100 nautical miles a day, left no trace. The official inquiry in 1910 heard from witnesses who described heavy weather and a vessel prone to listing, but no single cause could be proved. 
Funding for further searches was debated, with the South African government weighing the cost, £10,000, against a growing sense of futility. By 1911, the effort was called off. Decades later, private expeditions using side-scan sonar and drift-back modelling narrowed the probable wreck area to 100 square nautical miles. Still, no confirmed wreck has been found. Maritime historian Wim de Ruita sums up the corridor's reputation, saying that Agulha's retroflexion against gales steepens waves in minutes, and that Waratah's corridor grew fast. The Waratah's fate is more than a ghost story. It is a case study in how ocean physics, limited data, and brutal weather can erase a ship from the map. In March 1918, the USS Cyclops steamed north from Barbados, loaded with over 11,000 tons of manganese ore, far above her rated capacity. The ship carried 306 people, including crew and passengers, into a region where the Atlantic Shelf drops away to depths beyond 4,000 meters. Wartime secrecy shrouded her route. Navy orders restricted radio traffic, and the threat of German submarines forced ships to avoid predictable patterns, often traveling alone and unescorted. Cyclops's last known position, logged near 31 degrees north and 65 degrees west, sits just inside the western edge of the so-called Bermuda Triangle, but the real hazards were less exotic and more relentless. The Gulf Stream runs strong here, pushing surface water northward at up to two knots, while below, eddies spin off into the abyss. Engine room logs from March 3rd note overheating and a persistent list to port, possibly a sign of uneven cargo or hull stress from the overload. The final maintenance entry, dated March 4th, reads simply the words, all normal. No distress call was ever received. Naval archive analysts later reconstructed possible routes using cargo manifests, speed logs, and Gulfstream drift models. Their calculations showed that given the ship's overloaded state and the rough weather reported by other vessels in the area, a structural failure in heavy seas was plausible. The manganese ore, dense and prone to shifting, could have destabilized the ship if the hull flexed or a sudden roll occurred. Innes McCartney, a maritime archaeologist, describes the search for Cyclops as a battle against both time and physics. With no verified debris field and no survivors, the search area ballooned into thousands of square miles. Wartime tracking gaps and radio silence meant that even the best drift models could only narrow the uncertainty corridor so much. Decades of sonar sweeps and deep sea expeditions have turned up nothing but sediment and shadow. The absence of a wreck amplifies the mystery, but the ingredients, overload, rough seas, deep water, and missing data are all too familiar. Cyclops' disappearance is not just an isolated tragedy. It fits the same pattern as other ocean graveyard cases, where the right combination of risk factors can erase a ship from history almost overnight. Maritime graveyard mapping begins with data, thousands of shipwreck records, high-resolution seafloor maps, global vessel tracking feeds, and archives of storms and currents. Each dataset brings its own lens and its own blind spots. Shipwreck databases, like those kept by Lloyds or National Heritage Agencies, plot losses across centuries, but the dots are only as accurate as the reports and the technology of their time. Bathymetric grids, assembled from sonar and satellite altimetry, reveal the hidden contours of the ocean floor, shelves, banks, and abrupt drop-offs where danger accumulates. Modern Automatic Identification System, abbreviated AIS, logs streaming from ships worldwide capture the pulse of maritime traffic, highlighting where vessels cluster, cross, and squeeze through narrow straits. Historical storm archives add another layer, tracing the paths of cyclones, nor'easters, and gales that have battered shipping lanes for generations. To find patterns, scientists overlay these layers using geographic information systems. Wreck positions are matched against bathymetric features to see where ships most often founder, near shelf edges, capes, or shifting shoals. AIS heat maps reveal how traffic density and route geometry intersect with known hazards. Storm tracks are cross-referenced with loss records to pinpoint where weather and geography stack risk. Bias correction plays a critical role. Older wrecks are easier to find in shallow water, and some regions are overrepresented simply because they have been searched more thoroughly. Recent advances, including artificial intelligence, now help cluster incidents and correct for these reporting gaps. The result is a composite map, 
one that does not just count wrecks, but shows where and why the ocean repeatedly claims ships, regardless of era or technology. Patterns on the map reveal more than isolated tragedies. They show that the world's most dangerous sea zones share a recipe. Four categories stand out, each with its own signature hazards. The first category is the current and wind rogue wave zone, where powerful currents run headlong into opposing winds. In places like the Agulhas Corridor, these collisions steepen waves to breaking point, turning routine swells into sudden walls of water. Ships crossing these regions face risks that multiply with every knot of current and gust of wind. The second category is the Shoal and Storm Coast. Here, shallow banks and sandbars shift over time, sometimes moving by meters each year. Storms drive waves onto these hidden obstacles, creating breaking surf far from land. The Outer Banks off North Carolina are a classic example. Thousands of wrecks dot the barrier islands, many lost to shifting shoals and hurricane-driven seas. Third are the traffic compression choke points. In these narrow corridors, the sheer volume of ships raises the baseline risk. The Straits of Malacca and Singapore see 100,000 vessel movements a year, with some channels narrowing to less than two nautical miles. Here, even a minor miscalculation can trigger collisions that ripple through crowded lanes, as ships race to react in seconds rather than minutes. The last category is the remote cold water storm engine. These are vast open stretches like the Drake Passage or the Grand Banks, where relentless storms, icy water and isolation combine. Wrecks here are often lost beyond the reach of search, their stories scattered by weather and time. Each category stacks physical forces, geography and human limits into a repeatable pattern, making certain parts of the ocean far deadlier than others. South of Africa, the coastline bends into a long, exposed arc where two of the ocean's most powerful forces collide. The Agulhas Current, one of the fastest on Earth, races southwest along the shore at up to two and a half meters per second. Centuries of shipping have funneled vessels through this corridor, and the toll is staggering. Archaeological records and national databases list at least 1,500 confirmed wrecks around South Africa, with hundreds concentrated along the Cape of Good Hope and Agulhas Bank. Some tallies suggest more than 600 losses in this single region, a density unmatched by most other coasts. What sets this zone apart is not just the number of ships lost, but how the sea itself stacks the odds. When a strong southwesterly gale meets the Agulhas current head-on, the result is a sudden, violent transformation. Waves that once rolled in long, predictable swells are squeezed by the opposing flow, their heights climbing and their faces steepening until they break with little warning. Engineers call it wave steepening, and mariners know it as the moment the ocean turns hostile. The broad, shallow Agulhas Bank acts as an amplifier, forcing deep water into a rising shelf that further shortens and sharpens the waves. A ship caught beam on in these conditions can be rolled or broken apart in minutes. Oceanographer Wim de Rueta explains that when a westerly storm slams into the Agulhas, the sea can go from rough to impossible in less than an hour. This is not folklore, it is a documented rogue wave hotspot where the physics of current, wind and bathymetry combine to erase ships from sight. The pattern is unmistakable. Dense clusters of wrecks line up with the zones where current and wind run at odds and where the search for survivors or debris often comes up empty. Here, the graveyard is not a myth, but the result of a repeatable recipe that has claimed vessels for 400 years. Off North Carolina, the sea hides a restless borderland, the Outer Banks, where sand and water never stand still. Along this arc of barrier islands, more than 2,000 shipwrecks have been recorded, forming the core of what sailors call the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The number climbs higher in some tallies, but the true count depends on how far you draw the line and how many lost hulls the sand has covered for good. The danger here is not just storms, but the way the seafloor itself moves beneath the waves. Shoals and sandbars shift by meters each year, sometimes even faster after a hurricane. A safe channel on one chart can become a trap on the next tide. Diamond Shoals, the most infamous of these bars, has broken up vessels from wooden schooners to steel freighters. When storm swells roll in from the Atlantic, they meet these shallow ridges and stand up into steep, breaking waves that can broach a ship 
or drive it hard aground, even when the horizon looks deceptively calm. For mariners, the outer banks offer a narrow margin for error. A missed calculation or a misread current can put a vessel over shifting ground where charts are already out of date. After a wreck, wind and tide strand debris for miles along the islands, turning each storm into a new chapter in the region's wreck archive. John M. Wilkin, a coastal hydrographer, describes it simply. The shelf here turns survivable seas lethal. Shoals move, storms change the rules, and the ocean writes its own map. In the graveyard of the Atlantic, the hazards are alive and the boundary between safe passage and disaster is always moving. In the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, the ocean graveyard takes a different shape. Here, the killer is not hidden shoals or rogue waves, but relentless compression. The strait funnels more than 100,000 vessel movements each year through channels that shrink to just 1.96 nautical miles at Phillips Channel. Tankers, container ships and ferries all share the same tight lanes, separated by little more than painted lines and radio calls. Over a 25-year window, official records count 888 accidents, collisions, groundings and fires, crowded into a space smaller than some open ocean search boxes from 2001 to 2007 alone. 236 casualties were recorded, despite advances in radar, the automatic identification system, and mandatory reporting. The pressure is systemic. At peak times, ships pass within minutes of each other, each captain calculating closest point of approach while watching a radar screen filled with moving targets. Fatigue builds as watchkeepers face endless streams of traffic, forced to make split-second decisions with little room for error. In this environment, a single misread maneuver can trigger a chain reaction. A near miss in Phillips Channel can force five vessels into emergency turns within two minutes, as happened in 2017. The Singapore Vessel Traffic Service, perched at the heart of this system, coordinates real-time rerouting and alerts, but even the best technology cannot erase the limits of human attention. Experts describe the strait as a conveyor belt. One disruption ripples outward, compressing decision time for every ship behind. Human factors, fatigue, communication breakdowns, and normalization of risky shortcuts combine with the strait's geometry to produce a graveyard where the danger is not a single catastrophic wave, but a cascade of small errors that under pressure become impossible to escape. The graveyard here is built from density and decision overload not from the sea itself. Even with modern technology, new graveyards still emerge, reminders that physics, geography, and human limits keep rewriting the sea's ledger. Today, over 100,000 ships cross high-risk choke points each year, and every route holds its own recipe for loss. The ocean's mysteries are not curses, they are patterns we are still learning to read. The next disappearance could redraw the map. Share your thoughts, and stay curious for the next story.